we can look at uh, illiteracy. Now in the rural areas it's very very high so uh, this is measured by the proportion of men who sign the marriage register in churches um, with just an X with just their mark who can't spell their own name and so in Bedfordshire for example which is a rural part of England um, almost 60 percent of people or men are illiterate it's also over 50 percent in Monmouth in Hertfordshire in Suffolk in Cambridgeshire in Huntingdon and Buckinghamshire it's just about 50 percent but if you look at Middlesex which would be the main county covering London uh, illiteracy is very low it's under 20 percent so 80 percent of the people living in Middlesex in 1840 uh, could read and write in Surrey it's also uh, illiteracy is only about 25 percent Surrey is another administrative uh, region covering London at that time um, so there 70 or 75 percent of the population uh, could read in Yorkshire the uh, East Riding of Yorkshire uh, which is very urban it's under 30 percent in Lancashire uh, which is Manchester and Liverpool it's under 30 percent so you can see that there's a big difference in literacy in the countryside you the, the countryside of the people remaining in the countryside the kind of people described by William Cobbett in Rural Rides are in a really wretched condition and part of and part of that is that they're largely illiterate whereas no matter how, all except the very, very poor um, in London, uh, Manchester, Birmingham, uh, the new, uh, Liverpool, the, the new big industrial cities, most of those um, appear to be literate, at least at a basic level, and therefore uh, ready and capable to consume newspapers. Then there's the issue of how much money people had to spend on newspapers, which are, after all, uh, an optional item compared with um, food and housing. Economists have got various measures of this uh, over time and one of them uh, is the amount of tea and sugar people can consume because you, you can live without tea and sugar so if you've got so if you're so poor that you, you you're, you're kind of on the bread line you're not going to buy much tea and sugar now we always think of the uh, the first part of the uh, 19th century as a time of great poverty thanks to the work of Charles Dickens at looking back at that time the workhouse poverty generally but when you use this measure of tea and sugar what you find is um, people are consuming exactly the same amount year on year it does dip slightly in the 1820s so you might think that the average person uh, is a bit worse off there. They can't afford to buy this. Um, this is fairly common, but not absolutely necessary commodity of tea. So between the year 1800 and 18, the years 1800 and 1850, that's when the time when the population doubles and people, you know, the cities really take off. We think of that uh, being in absolute terms uh, a time of great poverty but the story from tea and sugar is that people are consuming exactly the same amount year on year there so what's happening there is some people are very very poor but other people in these new cities are wealthier than they were in the 18th century uh, and the average overall is uh, is about the same after 1850 However, there's a dramatic increase in the quantity of tea and sugar, and that would tend to uh, indicate that people are getting wealthier. And that corresponds with a second wave of increase in circulation of newspapers as well. Because newspapers become more viable as businesses, not only when people have got a little bit more money in their pocket to buy tea, more tea and sugar, or should, you know, they're going down to the shops, what shall I have, extra tea or sugar or a copy of the news of the world? That is going on. But more importantly, the news of the world can carry advertising from the tea and sugar manufacturers who are after this disposable income. So that general rise in the prosperity of the country uh, after 1850 is, uh, is rather significant. Another measure of uh, how much money people have got in their pockets is the proportion of income in surveys uh, that is spent on 
absolute necessities and on luxury goods. So in 1844, for example, in a, in a survey it, taken in Ashton under line in, in Manchester, a working class district of Manchester, just over 60% of the household income went on food. Um, another 10% or so went on uh, rent, uh, fuel and light, another 5% or so on clothing. And that left them with about 10% of their total income um, uh, to spend on, on everything else, on, on dis what, what you call disposable income. So if, if the average family there in Ashton under in Manchester in 1844 is earning £10 a week from working in factory, then uh, they're going to spend just over £6 of that on food, another £2 on rent, fuel and light, um, about £1.50 on clothing and £1.50 on lots of other things, including newspapers. Now, if you look at the data for... 1950, the 1950s, that's 100 years later, um, then the proportion spent on food has dropped to under, to about 30%, and disposable income is about 30%. So people are pretty poor in the 1840s, they've got less money to dispose of, uh, that they can play with on buying newspapers, but they're not, they've not got no money at all, as you might think from looking at the picture of the Victorian world that's given to us by um, Charles Dickens and so on, and Frederick Engels, uh, who wrote his book, The Condition of the English Working Classes. Now, he's looking at that section of the working class who are very, very poor. They certainly don't buy newspapers. They're probably illiterate, uh, and they have very, very poor conditions indeed, but they're, what, 10 or at, the, at most 20% of the population you've got another 60% um, of the population who are kind of okay, and some of those are pretty wealthy, and then you've got a growing uh, middle class um, who are very, very wealthy in the new cities, and then on top of that you've got the usual 5, 2, 3, 4, 5% of uh, plutocratic uh, billionaires who um, probably don't bother reading newspapers anyway. So that's the demographics, and they're pretty perfect for the establishment of a newspaper industry. You've got a large and growing population. It's easy to reach them in cities. They're homogeneous, meaning they all speak the same language. They're all subject to the same political regime. If England goes to war against Russia in the Crimean War, as it did, then that's news right across the country. It's news in Manchester and Bristol and Liverpool and Southampton and London and everywhere. So you can you can have a national press that's dealing with that. It's not a huge, sprawling country like Russia or, or even Germany, which at that time was divided into dozens of little states, and so the news agenda in each one was different. You've got a big, homogeneous uh, um, country. You, uh, they're living in cities. City dwellers are very news-hungry. It's a time of huge social changes, of new inventions, of news of, in all its forms happening all the time. The, the people there are pretty poor on the whole in the cities, but they have enough money to buy newspapers. Uh, many of them 